as he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. Two phrases powerfully combined together are rarely seen. In those two phrases, as he, Jesus, died to make men holy, let us live to make men free, we see both the purpose of the good news of Jesus Christ and the product of the good news of Jesus Christ. We see them both. And just th- that little phrase, as he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. The purpose, to make us holy. It's not to make us better than someone else. That's not what holy means. Holy means to purify and to set apart. And today, in the sanctuary, we saw the symbol of that, right? We saw part of the symbol of that. We saw the baptism. And in a way, we know that that symbolizes the purification of us from our sins. But more powerfully, it symbolizes the, the, the purity of purpose That we are now joined with Christ. Those of us who follow him, we are now joined with Christ in his baptism. And we're raised to walk in newness of life. That we've given a purity of purpose. And the product, the product of the good news of Jesus Christ is that we proclaim liberty to the captives. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus said. He he said, I've come to proclaim liberty to the captives. He was quoting an Old Testament prophet. That hymn that we sung today was written on November the 18th, 1861. It was written by Julia Ward Howe the day, the night of, the day that she encountered a conflict between Confederate soldiers and Union soldiers in Virginia encountered them too closely for comfort. She and both of her both she and her husband were abolitionists. They believed to the core that no person should own another person. And they had made it their purpose to see that America no longer allowed someone to be enslaved in this country, that this country would actually be the land of the free. But in this conflict, as they were making their way away from it, they heard the Union soldiers marching in the battle singing a tune known as John Brown's Body. It was an abolitionist tune. And as they sung it, Julia Ward Howe thought, there's got to be better words for that. And so she went and penned the words to the song that we sang this morning. During the the middle of this conflict known as the Civil War, the weight was just unbearable on our president. And and while the the causes of the war were complex and there were many, and some would argue that it was about states' rights, the chiefs among those states' rights was the right to own another person, not as a person, but as property. And 35 years earlier, President Lincoln, but then a 19-year-old, had traveled a 1,000 miles down the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers. And as a 19-year-old, he saw slavery for the first time, and it was reprehensible, and it marked him. He would go to call it the great moral evil in our country. And as the the war drug on and the the many reasons and the complex reasons for it, he knew if he was to save the Union, he had to do something to solidify the cause. So he made it all about making people free. And hence, they would sing a song like John Brown's Body when they walked in to battle because they knew what they were fighting for. And he would write the Emancipation Proclamation but it would, be, it would be years after his death, two years after his death, that the 14th Amendment outlawing the ability of any person to own another person would be ratified. But in the wake of the hymn that we saw, we sung today, and we saw the words as we read them, in the wake, there was a country in turmoil But they had a theme song now. And in 1864, for the first time in American history, we would see a coin, the Union coin, 
The economy was struggling, and so the idea was let's, let's make a, a two cents piece. And so they made a two cent piece. And for the first time in our nation's history, you would see the words, in God we trust, appear on our money. Most of us know that as a 1950s thing, but it actually happened in the 1860s. Because we were a country, not in some kind of radical Christian nationalism. No, we were a country that was just bent down and beat down. And we were at this place where we had to cry to relief to a God, the only God we knew. Influence. Julia Ward Howe, influencer. Abraham Lincoln, influencer. Jesus quoting Isaiah. I have come to set the captives free. Influencer. Our Green Berets, they have this phrase in Latin, and it means this. It means to liberate, to liberate the oppressed. We're all called to be influencers. We've been talking about that. That those of us who follow Jesus, we are called to be influencers. And what we have said is that, 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 you know, we we look at ourselves, those of us who follow him. And if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, I'm so glad you're here. Because you're going to hear again what motivates us and pushes us forward as a group of people. And you might be thinking, well, Blake, I'm not a president. It's not likely any of us will. Most of us couldn't qualify to be a Green Beret. Some of us are. Most of us can't write music like Julia Ward Howe. Some of us can. But all of us that follow Jesus, let me tell you what you are. You are an ambassador of Christ. As though God was making his appeal from you. You, if you are a follower of Jesus, you shape the thoughts and the opinions of People have about Jesus by the way that they look at you. And so we started this series several weeks ago called Influencer, not because we're professional influencers, few of us are, but because any of us who carry the cross of Christ into tomorrow, we are personal influencers. We shape people's thoughts and opinions of Jesus and we said to, to, to decide and to discover and to uncover what a true good influencer looks like. We were going to go back and we were going to look at Nehemiah, this Old Testament figure. He wasn't a president. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a judge. He wasn't a king. He was a more regular guy. But he was an incredible influencer. And we've been picking up traits and if, of, a, of an influencer. And if you have your flyer with you, if it made the journey from the sanctuary, you can see that there are several traits that we've already discovered. And we're only going to pick up one this morning, just due to time. And we'll pick up the second next week. One more, rather. And the one we're going to pick up this morning is this one, strategic silence. Strategic silence is the wisdom to understand before we undertake To probe before we proclaim. Strategic silence. And we're going to see this in Nehemiah's life. But let's remind ourselves of where Nehemiah was when we left off last week. That he had had this acute perception, a a, a passionate affinity, and, and it divinely aligned himself. So important, divine alignment is the most important of all these traits that we'll discover throughout the summer. Divine alignment says, not so much i got to get God on my side, as it says, i got to make sure that I'm on God's side. And he had done that. And God had granted him his wish that there was these oppressed people that he wanted to see liberated. These derided people that he wanted to see changed. In a city a thousand miles away from him that he had never been to, called Jerusalem. And he wanted that to change. And he had prayed and fasted and prayed and fasted. And God let him go because the good hand of God was upon him. He was an official in the Persian court. He was a guy with a Jewish name that meant the comfort of Yahweh. And somehow he's number four as the chief of staff in the Persian court. And he talks to the king and this is what happens The king granted me what I asked for, for the good hand of my God was upon me. 
You see the divine alignment there. And not only that, he sets off toward Jerusalem and he comes to the governors of the providence beyond the river and he gave them the king's letters. He had credentials from the king and now the king had sent with me not just these letters, he had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. These guys that knew how to handle a horse. At this point in warfare, if you had horsemen, they were swift, they were light, and they gave you the advantage. Nehemiah is riding high now. If, 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 this could, if we could just do a little bit of something, a little anachronistic, what is playing in the dashboard of the horse right now is nothing's going to stop us now from the 80s. That, that's where they are. Maybe Bob Marley's, every little thing is going to be all right. That's, this is where he is at this point. He's top of his game. He's cruising now. It's a beautiful day. You too. All of it is playing. That's part of the playlist. He gets closer and closer in his 1,000-mile journey. is coming to an end. And, and Jerusalem is on the, high, on the horizon. And this, this is what he sees. Someone sends him a, a, a notice that these two guys named Samballot and Tobiah, the Ammonite servant, heard that Nehemiah was coming. Somehow they knew what he was going to do. How they figured that out, I don't know. Because Nehemiah was strategically silent. But it displeased these guys. How in the world could anyone be displeased with Nehemiah? Now think about it. He's, got, he's divinely aligned. He's got powerful approval from the king. He's got the, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, the Jewish people. He's got their best interest at heart. Who, is, who in the world would want to put salt in this man's game? Anyone who is profiting off of the misfare of the people of Jerusalem. See these guys? Tobiah? And Sam Ballot, they were making a profit off of the derision of the people. They were making a profit off of those people who were oppressed. The people that he had come to liberate. The people that he had come to protect. The people that he had come to give them a chance at prosperity. But you know what Nehemiah does? He just keeps on rolling. He rolls on into Jerusalem and he's there for three days. Three days. What does he do for three days? He waits. He prays. He looks. He listens. He watches. He's strategically silent. Strategic silence is not necessarily still. It's strategic. And so after the third day, he gets up out of bed at night And he takes a few men with him. And he told no one what God had put into his heart to do for Jerusalem. Told nobody. And there was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. One animal is a whole lot more quiet than two animals. And he only needed one among them to do what he needed to do. Let's talk for a minute about what's going on here with this this strategic silence. I'm telling no one what's going on. Obviously, he's told some people because there's some guys with him. Somehow, Tobiah and Samballot knows, but the, the general public do not know. They've just seen this guy with Persian officials and horsemen and all this wood roll up into their city, probably thinking, hey, this guy is going to take advantage of us just like everybody else takes advantage of us. And then he doesn't do anything for three days. He's just, he's just there. And it's curious to them, it has to be curious to them, why has he got a Jewish name? But all this Persian stuff around him, what is going on? But they don't see him because he goes out at night. Here's here's what's going on. Whenever Whenever we are strategically silent, it gives us more time to divinely align. It gives us time to pray and ask two very crucial questions before we move out into whatever it is that God's calling us to. To check ourselves and say, God, is this indicative of your word? Is this indicative of your way? 
Are the words that I'm about to say and what I'm about to initiate, is it in line with your spirit and is it is in line with your word? It gives you more time to divinely align. The second thing it does is it provides focus to probe and prove to yourself what you think is the reality. This is, this is not so much an issue for Nehemiah, but it is an issue for any of us today. We need to check our motives. Why am I about to say what I'm about to do? Why am I about to do what I'm about to do? To, to probe and to prove that what I see as reality, what my acute perception is showing me, is indeed what I need to do. The, the third thing, is, it has to do with the information. It allows Nehemiah, and you're going to see him use a word very similar to this one. He's going to inspect. It allows him to investigate before he instigates. And the last thing it does, for any of us that will just take a beat and be strategically silent, it allows silence to strengthen you prior to your critic's resistance. And many times, and many times what it does, now in Nehemiah's case, it's absolutely doing this. He's got someone that's against him. But in many times, what it will do, if we'll be strategically silent, and you're going to see it's not static, it's not still in just a moment. But if we'll do this, it will not only give us confidence against those people that might be our critics, it may silence them before they even start. Because you'll answer their questions before the questions are even answered. So he goes out by night. Now, this is a good time to point, that, point out that everything that happens in Nehemiah is not prescriptive. It's descriptive. Not everything he does we're supposed to do. I'm not suggesting that you go out by night. In order for him to be strategically silent, he had to go out by night. Last night, I was walking, uh, you know, I, I was half praying for rain and half going over the sermon. And I was walking through and I had the, the sermon with me and I was getting to an end. And I was thinking about this very point And I was thinking, yeah, you got to be careful walking at night. I need to tell people not to be out at night. And all of a sudden, I hear this, this, this rustling of the grass beside me. The rapid rustling of the grass beside me. And there's this bulldog on me barking all of a sudden. And I'm not talking like a Georgia bulldog, those kind that can't really walk very well. I don't know, this guy was felt, I think is the word. And, and he was not happy with me for whatever reason. And it's a pretty cool neighborhood. I mean, we don't have a lot of bulldogs running the streets. And this guy is on me all of a sudden. And he is barking. And I do that thing where I kind of sound, I, I do that high pitch thing. It's, it's very unmanly. Like, eh, you know, and... Um, I think maybe because that is a, that's a high-pitched sound, it carries further so I can get help if I need it. I'm not sure. It's just a visceral response. And so I notice that he's barking at me, so I think, well, I'm not going to be a wimp and back down from this dog. So I take the sermon, and, and I do like this, and then I think, no, I'll read the sermon to him. And so I start reading the sermon to him. He sits down on his hand qu hindquarters. Then he lays down, and he goes to sleep. It was really good. <laughs> Actually, I started chasing him. It was kind of funny. But anyway, anyway, not saying that we need to go out by night, but, the, but that's what he did because by going out, what he does is he gains the enemy's perspective. He sees what does these walls look like for someone who's trying to get in, what needs to be fixed first. He goes to the dragon gate, to the dung gate. He inspects the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down, its gates that have been destroyed by fire. And I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me. The, the gate was so broken that he couldn't even ride underneath it. And I went up to the night, into the night, by the valley and inspected. Again, what he's doing here, this is the second time you see him use this word, He's, he's inspecting before he instigates, or before he, rather, initiates. He's taking a look at this, and he turns back, and he enters by the valley gate, and so returned. And he reminds us again of the strategic silence. He says, the officials did not know where I had gone, what I was doing. I had not yet told the Jews. The priest hadn't even told the religious leader. I hadn't told the people that had power and influence. I haven't talked to the other influencers. I haven't talked to the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were due to do the work. 
In the interest of time, I'm going to wind things down, and we'll pick up the rest of the sermon next week. But I want to ask you a question. For those of you who were here when we began this series, I ask you to take time to pray through and write through some things that maybe you saw out there that you knew shouldn't be. Things that, 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 that you felt like maybe God was, was moving you to change. A vision for your life maybe. Or maybe just for your family. Or maybe it's just a relationship. If you remember, if you were in the sanctuary this morning and I asked you to write these things down, you'll remember I said, but don't tell anybody right now. And I said, I will tell you later. And the reason I said that is because I want to encourage you just to be strategically silent about this. For a moment. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Have you seen it? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Can you see it? You stand a better chance of seeing it if you're strategically silent for a while. Whoever you share it with, whoever that you trust with what God has placed in your heart, they stand a better chance of seeing it and hearing and responding if you have been strategically silent before the Lord. Yeah, there's nobody in here that's a president. There may be a few in here that could be. Not all of us are Green Berets. Not all of us are poets. We're not officials in a Persian court. But we're ambassadors. We're ambassadors that, that have been praying a prayer of divine alignment now for four weeks. God, let me see what you see. Move me by what moves you. God, let me see what you see. Move me by what moves you. Let me be moved by that. I want to add to those prayers as we wrap up today. A prayer, a single prayer of strategic silence. If you'll notice in your, your, your flyer, it actually connects to Scripture. And here it is. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting life. Or life everlasting. Way everlasting. It's based on a, a, a psalm. And that's just something that you can pray. This, this, is, this is a prayer that you can pray that will hold you in strategic silence until it's time for you to let go. And you're going to see next week as we pick up, you're going to see Nehemiah's compelling communication. But, but when, when we sit in strategic silence long enough, that compelling communication, it's like... It's like a rubber band that has been pulled back and waiting and waiting and waiting. And there's just so much energy to be released. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me and see if there be any hurtful way in me. And lead me in your everlasting way. We believe here at this church that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That, that no one comes unto the Father except by Jesus. And if you've not met him, if you don't have a relationship with him that's real and personal, we want to ask you to come forward this morning. Susie and I will be here. And by come forward, I mean just walk down the aisles. We're going to sing this song. Giles is going to lead us. And you can just walk down and you can talk to Susie or I about your relationship with God. If, if now is the time for you to partner with this church in the good news, you, you know what we're about. We're about this. We're about a Jesus that died to make men holy so that we could live to make men free. If that sounds like your church and you're looking for one, come forward. Let's stand and sing now.